Hey everyone. Good afternoon. So welcome to today's uh, COEB webinar, uh, ESOL transitions to uh, college and certifications, you know, supporting the college and career readiness for English language learners. Um, thanks so much for joining. It looks like people are still dropping into the conversation. Please do introduce yourself in the chat so that we know who's here today. I can take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Tad Wamister. I'm Director of Partnership Development at Engine, which means I get to work with all different types of organizations across the US, ranging from libraries to adult learning centers, nonprofits, community colleges, and even employers who have uh, English language learners who are students or workers, and they need uh, additional language and skills development so that they can connect with opportunity. Um, I've been working with immigrants and refugees for about 14 years now, um, doing a lot of work supporting highly skilled immigrants and connecting with uh, career pathways and restarting their career in the US, um, have worked with a variety of different refugee focused organizations, um, and have been with the engine team for about two and a half years now. Thanks, Tad. I'm Katie Nielsen. I'm the founder and chief education officer at Engine. I've been working with immigrants in the US for almost 25 years, um, which seems like a very long time all of a sudden. My PhD is in second language acquisition, and I basically spent my whole career working on ways to help make English learning more accessible, more effective, and more efficient for speakers of other languages in the United States so that we can quickly get them the English skills they need for promotion, for advancement, for access to further education and training, for integration. Um, I have built a platform that we use to teach learners all over the country. As Tad said, we have partnerships with all sorts of organizations. And we're really excited to talk to you today about best practices for blended learning and for really creating programs that can drive educational outcomes that we need our speakers of other languages to have access to. Um, I see that uh, people have been very active about introducing themselves in the chat. Um, as we get through those introductions, please feel free to uh, share your comments, questions with panelists, and I'll make sure that those are included in today's discussion. Um, so please use the uh, chat actively for engagement and for any questions that come up along the way. Yes, we will save time for questions at the end, but we will collect them as we go. And Tad is monitoring the chat. So please, please let us know if, you, if we're being confusing or you want more information because we're happy to make this as interactive as possible. So this is a brief overview of what we're going to cover today. We just did the introduction part of all of this. Uh, we're gonna go into some some best practices for language learning in general and talk about blended programs that make sense. I think it's nice to start that way so we all have a common language and a common foundation into how to build effective programs. We're going to touch on digital literacy. This comes up all the time when we talk about working with learners who are speakers of other languages and may have varying levels of formal education, uh, varying levels of familiarity with digital tools. And then what we're really excited to share with you are some effective models. So we're not just talking about theory, we want to explain to you different programs across the country that have created blended models and that have worked. Um, and we'll end with a discussion of measuring outcomes, how to do it, what we should be looking for, and best practices for making sure that our programs are effective. There is a readiness gap between language learning programs and college and career readiness programs. Um, I think everyone sees it, it's why why we struggle to support English language learners as they're entering career training in higher education. And what we have built is a platform that really helps us bridge this readiness gap. So what we are doing is we're taking real world task-based information and giving it to language learners so that they can get into career training or higher education and also get the support they need while they're in those programs. And it all comes down to building a needs-based language program, which is what we're going to get into today. 
to start off with, I, I want to, to level set by saying that English training is acquiring a skill. It's not studying a content area. So giving learners lists of vocabulary words doesn't help them get the skills they need to be able to get into a certification program or a career training program or an English for academic purposes program. What they need is practice using English to do whatever it is they're going to need it to be able to do. And that's a, a really important distinction to make between programs that are effective and programs where learners just don't have the skills they need to succeed. And so the framework that we like to talk about is task-based language teaching. And what this means is that we start with what learners have to be able to do. So you start with an analysis of the tasks that learners are going to have to be able to accomplish using English and you work backwards. Because we can't teach everybody all of English in any sort of uh, effective or scalable way. But we can analyze learners' proficiency, figure out what language skills they need, and then give them practice with those skills so that they can get into a program where they'll continue to build their language skills in the area that they want to focus in. And we know that a blended approach actually works best. And what this means is we wanna use software for what technology can do best, so people can do what humans do best. And you'll see this as a theme throughout today's webinar. Integration is key to success. You can't use standalone software by itself. It needs to be integrated into a instructional approach that leverages coaches or teachers or administrators, some sort of internal champion to make sure that learners are actually progressing. And the other really important thing that works no matter what kind of an English program you have is that you want to use real world materials. There are decades of data showing that when you use materials that are written by curriculum designers, they don't give learners the, the language they need to do things in the real world. They need to listen to real examples of people talking to their supervisors, listening to OSHA training materials, uh, listening to academic lectures, understanding what it means to create a works cited page, whatever it is your learners need to be able to do, they need to practice with those real skills and get the language skills they need to do those tasks. So it all goes back into the figuring out why people are learning English and working backwards to give them real world practice. So uh, let's just take a moment to recap uh, what's different uh, about Engine because we are a, an incredibly different platform and company. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Engine established itself as a public benefit corporation. So we have um, not only an effective tool, but a mission to support equity and access uh, to opportunity at scale for adult English language learners. How we do that is through our web and mobile platform that delivers a personalized experience to learners. And it adapts based on their proficiency level, their native language, their goals and interests. Um, and you know, as Katie shared, uh, the more that uh, adults are, are interested in the topic at hand, the more engaged they will be. Um, <clears throat> we have this easy to run platform that has been used by thousands of different organizations, um, but also we provide hands-on support from our customer success team. Um, they work with you to launch different cohorts of learners, um, to stand up new career pathway or academic bridge transition programs. Um, and they are with you along the way, providing professional development to teachers and support for different, um, you know, different program launches across semesters. Um, that career specific content, we now have over 70 courses in the platform, and these range from you know, general English courses, academic prep courses, we have business skills and digital literacy, um, and then some of the most in demand career fields in technology, healthcare, manufacturing, and many others. We are always adding new content to the platform on a daily basis. Um, and we're adding new courses, typically on a monthly basis. So um, 
At the end of June, we added English for Entrepreneurship, uh, which is a really exciting new course that can support um, immigrant entrepreneurs who are looking to launch a business. And it also can support um, immigrant small business owners who don't have the time um, because they're working all the time, uh, but they, they need and want to learn English and it can help them to grow their business. Um, as Katie mentioned, all of these courses, all of these lessons, they come from real world materials. That might be a news article, an audio or video clip, technical training materials. And then for you as an organization, you can see exactly what your learners are doing. Their time on task, the lessons they're completing, the units and courses they're completing, as well as their end of unit assessment score. Um, and then the uh, proficiency assessment is typically delivered every 90 days to measure those um, skill gains over time. Um, the more that this coursework, the more that a platform is tailored to the real world needs, you know, helping them to achieve their goals. Um, and in this case, we're talking about career pathways, college readiness, um, and each learner is preparing, you know, for certificates, degrees, credentials that will improve their um, inclusion and their economic mobility. So I wanna talk a little bit about the different types of programs um, that we partner with um, whether that be a specific on-ramp or transition into a career pathway, um, it's incredibly important to make sure that, you know, if you have an English learner, are they ready for how difficult and the, you know, do they understand the vocational English they'll need to succeed in a, you know, career pathway training program? Bridge programs, whether that be helping students to um, prepare, you know, for further academic study, you know, for their GED, we have um, courses and content that directly relates to those uh, college transitions. I think something that's really exciting right now is that there is a renewed um, commitment to apprenticeship programs, those earn and learn opportunities that are, you know, can include, you know, incumbent workers. They can include professionals who need to work because not everyone can take, you know, months or years off to earn a certificate or a degree. Um, there's a lot of potential within apprenticeship programs, um, connecting with you know, good paying jobs, um, but you know, language learning, gathering, gaining those English skills that will allow someone to succeed in that apprenticeship, you know, that's where there's an opportunity in pre-apprenticeship and giving them that vocational English they need. Um, and I think most people on the call today are probably familiar with IET, those career specific uh, training programs. We have courses in, you know, healthcare, manufacturing, industry safety, technology um, that can be used and immediately plug into uh, an IET program. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about distance learning. So th the truth is that research on distance and blended learning has been going on for decades, um, but COVID-19 left many practitioners unprepared and scrambling and using Zoom to replace face-to-face -face instruction and not really thinking about how to structure distance learning. And so right now, we have a real opportunity to improve access and equity and inclusion via distance learning and to think about the future. We've shown over the last, I don't know how long it's been, 18 months longer, that everyone has been doing things partially remote, uh, that we can really reach learners wherever they are and offer a future that's more flexible, which is going to let us offer education to more adult learners who were precluded from participating because of job responsibilities, because of family responsibilities, because of transportation issues. But when we think about how to build a program like that, we should really try to take advantage of the benefits that technology offers. So I pulled together a bunch of best practices for setting up and executing online environments that come from the last 30 years of research on distance learning, hybrid learning, blended learning. The first is that your online environment needs to be structured to foster language learning if we're talking about reaching uh, English as a second language learners. And what that means is they need to have the ability to 
practice listening to authentic English, get feedback on error as they're interacting with real world materials and get many, many examples of people using English to do real things. And in this way, the role of technology can actually enhance the language learning process. In a face-to-face -face classroom, if you have eight learners, 10 learners, 30 learners all sitting in a room with you, and you are trying to give them practice with English, you can't give each learner the thing that's exactly right for their interests and needs and proficiency level. But we can do that with technology. We can adapt and personalize the learning experience which helps us solve a problem that's inherent in face-to-face -face classes. And the other thing we can do is monitor learner activity. This is super important. You want to be able to measure how much time your learners spend in a learning platform and what they're doing and how they're performing, not just to check a box uh, and show that you've met the requirements for funding or that learners have completed the requirements for credit, but so that you can take the information that you're getting and use it to make your instruction better. Look at how much time learners are spending, where they're struggling, if they need help with more help with listening or reading, and then adjust your in-person experiences to take advantage of those insights. That's really where the, we get a powerful benefit from distance learning. We can push learners to engage in virtual experiences in online classes. We can have them practice doing things online that are often so difficult for our second language learners. Opening up bank accounts, talking to customer service, um, getting help, writing emails to get help with accounts, enrolling children in schools, making appointments for online medical care. These are all things we all use the internet to do all day, every day. And you can help your language learners do those things in a supported way using distance learning. They can record themselves doing things like that and bring them back to class to you for, for help. You can, they can share their computer screen while they're doing a text chat and you can see what's happening and talk to them about what's going on. There are all sorts of ways to use distance learning and online training to bring the real world into your classrooms. The, the measuring outcomes and overall success is important to any program, but one of the benefits of an online program is that it's easy to measure outcomes and success as long as you make sure you're tracking things up front. Things that are much more difficult to capture face-to-face -face, you can do online because learners are interacting with technology and you can measure what happens. I told you one of the things we were gonna talk about over and over was integration. And I touched on this in the last slide, but I wanted to go into it in a little more detail. Integrated online instruction is the key to success. That means you want to use personalized adaptive technology. If you are using technology for instruction right now, there is no reason why it should not adapt to learners' needs. That's one of the benefits that technology can bring to the learning process. One size does not fit all, and you don't need to teach all of your English as a second language students the words for what to say at the zoo. You can teach them the language they need to read medicine bottles, apply for graduate school, uh, apply for a Google IT credential, fill out the intake paperwork um, at their local preschool for their children. Whatever it is, learners can practice doing real things with personalized learning. And you should be able to measure their engagement. But with those things, we can free up instructor time to really have interventions that make sense for learners' needs, moving learners rapidly into real world programs. There are, there, there's a huge demand right now for workers in basically every field. And second language learners are often left out of certification programs and training programs just because they don't have the English skills they need. With a, an approach that is personalized and adapted to learners' real world needs, you can help your ESOL students quickly get access to those training programs. Learning has moved online and it was happening anyway. COVID sped it up. We can now think about new instructional models and flexibility and access. But the question that comes up whenever I talk about this is, but, but what about my English as a second language learners? They often have very low levels of digital literacy. And uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a stat coming from the National Skills Coalition. Uh, they were surveying and looking at uh, the percentage of English language learners who had digital skills. Um, the majority, so 67% of those learners um, did not in fact have 
digital literacy skills, they had no digital literacy skills or limited digital literacy skills. And that really limits their potential to connect with training, you know, the topic of today's presentation, connecting uh, for college and career readiness. Um, so this is a, you know, this is an important consideration. Um, I do think as, uh, as programs are able to offer, you know, more face-to-face -face instruction, this is something that they can really try and address upfront because the more that they can open up digital fluency for their learners, the more options and, and self-study that someone will uh, be able to, you know, connect with. So we really um, have spent some time and prioritized this issue, thinking about how we can help English learners to connect with digital literacy skills. And this is not just a prerequisite for connecting with learning and being able to uh, you know, use learning management systems, but more and more jobs, whether it's a facilities worker, um, a housekeeper working in a warehouse, they require interaction with technology um, and connecting with career pathways and advancement opportunities. Uh, it's critical to have both language skills and digital fluency in place to be able to succeed. So how do we do this? Well, we at Engine um, are a mobile first platform and all of our content, um, the assessment, uh, you know, practicing vocabulary words, all of that is available on mobile devices through iPhone and Android apps. It's optimized for use on tablet. So a student doesn't have to have um, a specific device. And in fact, they can use different devices. They can start lessons on their, um, you know, on their phone and finish it on a computer or tablet. Um, once a learner gets into the platform, they can even study some of those foundational, you know, computer skills, internet, uh, email um, on their phone before they're even um, utilizing a computer. Um, it's incredibly important to integrate that, you know, those language skills with developing those critical foundational technology skills. And this can allow learners to then connect with more, uh, you know, career focused and career pathway trainings. Um, that are relevant to the jobs of the future. So this is just one, uh, it's almost like a map, a roadmap um, for building that foundation um, and how to connect with career pathway training. Well, learners have to build um, their general English skills. They need to um, understand digital literacy skills. Um, it also can be very useful for them to connect with those business skills and workplace readiness around uh, you know, email, phone calls, meetings, and even remote work. Um, so we spent a lot of time early on in the pandemic uh, developing those academic ready readiness as well as beginner and intermediate business skills courses. Um, and once a learner is able to connect with and build that foundation, they can expand into some of the more advanced trainings around you know, technology skills, customer service, healthcare, um, and entrepreneurship. So we're talking a lot about super specific English courses, which is what we know based on decades of research make the most sense for language learners. I wanted to go through a quick checklist for how you could get a needs-based English program started. The first thing to do is to answer some questions like who is learning English, what's their goal, and what's their language level, because this will help you figure out where to start. And then why do you want them to learn English, because the approach you take is going to be very different if you have people who are transitioning to academic ESL or transitioning to job training, people who just want to become eligible for workplace training or something else, but figuring out what this is goes a long way towards being able to measure outcomes at the end then what do they need to learn? Is it reading and writing skills? Is it speaking and listening? Is it a combination? Is there one more than the other? It's a super important question because you wanna focus the time on your instruction into the areas where learners need the most help. Uh, and then what resources are available for English learning? 
and then what model will, will work best. And Tad and I are going to go through a number of different models that we've seen be really successful with adult learners. Um, so a model where there's a partnership with an adult education program and an employer or transition program, um, something that's based in the workplace and a pre-apprenticeship model. These are all options for adult um, education providers. You have a lot of flexibility in how you offer your English language training, especially when you're thinking about something that is a blended model or a, a hybrid approach. A partnership with an employer would give you a whole population of learners with a common goal. So thinking about how to structure the program is really important upfront. Here are some example pathways, healthcare career pathways, where you can start with digital literacy, move into a certified nursing assistant on-ramp course, giving learners the language they need to become certified nursing assistants. I read something in the chat about vocabulary words being important, and, and that's really the, the key to the success of our program, is that we don't just think of lists of vocabulary words that seem to be topically relevant. We start with real examples of people doing their jobs as certified nursing assistants, the language that you need to get certified in a training program, the lectures that you hear from teacher trainers. And we take that real language content and turn it into adaptive lessons. So learners get the right content at the right time at the right proficiency level. In addition to the beginner level certified nursing assistant course, there is a more advanced patient care and support, a healthcare professionals course, and specialized content on things like basic life support and CPR. Learners can get access to the English they need for these training programs while they're in them, giving them really critical language support while they're transitioning to be in a healthcare career program. And we'll go into an example of this uh, when we get to the models that work. We, we walked through digital literacy a bit, but we just to give you some more information, learners get basic computer skills, basic internet skills, internet safety, and get the foundations that they need to move into more technical careers. There's lots and lots of talk right now about IT boot camps and uh, cybersecurity apprenticeships, um, IT help desk support, uh, digital, um, digital marketing programs. But those programs rarely include on-ramps for speakers of other languages. This pathway can be the beginning of that. And it works for learners who have zero digital literacy. And then for learners who are interested in college readiness, um, academic on-ramps and co-requisites help close the gap. And I think it's worth pointing out that it's not just about finish with an on-ramp and get access to college level courses. You need to think about the full transition. And a platform like ours can help learners not only get the academic readiness skills they need for college level work, it can support them while they're in college level classes so that they can get the language support they need for the coursework they're working on. And if I can jump in, there were a couple of questions uh, before going on. There was some questions about which um, courses and career pathways were included in the platform. One request was English for agriculture. Um, we've heard that before and it is, uh, it's on the list. We always um, try to prioritize the lists based on industry demand, um, as well as requests from prospects and customers. Um, one, uh, one area that was asked about was early childhood education. Um, and actually Katie and I were talking about uh, the courses that we're working on for fall. Um, so early childhood education has been prioritized. Um, we also have additional um, coursework, English for electricians um, and electrical technicians, um, as well as pharmacy tech. So we're always adding new career pathways based on requests from uh, customers and, and prospects. Um, the other question that I thought, you know, whether you wanna answer that now, um, Katie, or just go, um, go into it uh, within the uh, assessment portion was, uh, there was a question about understanding more for, you know, skills mastery. And I wanted you to talk about the end of unit assessments. Sure. So. And I will speak about assessments in more detail at the end, but because all of our content comes from real examples, like real training materials, uh, learners are take an achievement test at the end of every unit 
where we master how well they understand the content area. So it's integrated content with language. And there's an achievement test that they take every 20 lessons or so, where we get an ongoing picture of, of their overall mastery of what they're learning. At the same time, we have ongoing proficiency assessment so that we can measure what learner's level of English is so that we can adapt the platform as their level improves. It's all competency-based and it's designed to help learners move as quickly as possible through the content so that if their proficiency is improving, we can start giving them uh, language that's at a more difficult level of English so that they can get the practice they need to move into the career and college readiness that they're aiming for. And for anyone who is curious, um, I did put our current course catalog list in the chat so that you can download that as a PDF. Um, but again, this list is always growing. Uh, we're working on more content for healthcare, manufacturing, early childhood, and more. So stay tuned for those new, new courses that are coming out this fall. Yes, we, um, we add new content at a really rapid pace um, because of the technology that we've built that helps us do it really efficiently so that that's the way we can offer the right thing to the right learner at the right time. So having looked at hundreds, if not thousands of successful implementations over the last 10 years, there are seven requirements for a successful program. We need an internal champion. You can't take adult learners and just give them access to technology and say, go ahead and use this and um, learn. I mean, the, the evidence that that doesn't work is available in the completion rates for MOOCs. People need support and especially historically underserved populations need support and resources up front to use distance learning. You can't just tell them to go do it themselves. We know that successful language programs begin with a needs analysis. One of the reasons for this is because it lets you figure out what you need so that you can measure whether or not you've done it. Uh, we obviously need learners and they need clear objectives. There needs to be somebody offering the language course, funding for it, and the success metrics, because different courses will have different success metrics. Some of them will need learners to get to a certain proficiency level. Some of them will need learners to um, demonstrate a, a certain score on an entrance exam for further training. Some of them will need learners just to demonstrate that they've completed achievement tests at a certain proficient, at a certain, um, certain score, which is then used for admittance to another program. We have a, a program that does that in Colorado. So we, um, the way these seven things look can be very different across models, but every model needs to have these seven, which is our segue to exploring and scaling effective models. And I think um, it is so important to have both of those things. Uh, and scaling is something that we really need to work on. You know, pre-pandemic, uh, the Migration Policy Institute estimated we were only reaching 3.4% of adult English language learners. Um, that number has probably dropped during the pandemic. Um, so as we are returning, uh, programs need to you know, think about the innovation that has allowed them to scale their program and again, connect, help their learners to connect with career pathways. So I wanna share an example about an adult education provider who did not have a lot of experience using technology pre-pandemic um, and really you know, took advantage of this opportunity to try to enhance um, their virtual and self-study um, capabilities for their learners um, and also build new career-focused instruction. It's very important to set expectations up front about you know the engagement and expectations of learners you know what does success look like for them um, to use and to incorporate um, you know career focused and real world materials include those and integrate them within the live virtual classes um, help them to understand how this is one stop um, and that they're intended goal is to transition into a career focused program. So what are their long term goals, whether it's a degree, you know, whether it is a career pathway um, program or certification, you know, measure those outcomes. Uh, it's incredibly important to pay attention to learners, um, and this can help to connect with um, 
and achieve the you know reporting requirements for you know state level you know education or workforce funding. So let's actually look at some examples. This is a program, the Prep Program, which is in uh, Newport News, Virginia. Uh, they started using Engine last fall, um, where when, when they were trying to um, you know achieve career and workplace readiness for their English language learners. Um, they set very robust self-study goals for their students. Um, and you wouldn't believe the, you know, the, the success and how one instructor expanding to two were able to um, deliver multiple different sector-specific career pathway programs. Um, they got their learners ready to transition into these boot camps which started in the winter. And one had a tech focus, one had a you know, manufacturing and logistics focus, and another one had an allied healthcare focus. So now the learners were continuing to you know, use Engine um, on their own, you know, add more self-study, and it was very career specific. Uh, so their teacher didn't have to be a subject matter in tech and in healthcare. She was leveraging the content that was in the engine platform. And this, the intention of this program is to help those students to uh, transition at, to the local community college where they can earn a certificate in one of those in-demand career fields. There are actually programs right now and funding sources that can you know, sponsor and, and pay for the, the uh, you know, certification program, but learners have to be ready. And so, uh, by using this, this content and by integrating uh, technology into their, into their program, um, they were effectively able to uh, transition these students and prepare them to achieve their goals. Another one that I wanna talk a little bit about is our journey with Queens Public Library, um, their adult learning centers. Uh, we've been working with them for several years now uh, within pilots that have expanded um, even before um, the pandemic, uh, but have continued to thrive and adapt um, as those learning centers, you know, were not able to utilize their classrooms and had to be fully remote programs. Um, I also wanna recognize that uh, I know that uh, Sarah Sadiq, the blended learning coordinator for Queens Public Library is on this call. Um, so I wanted to share some lessons learned from the program um the assistant director of uh, the adult learning centers uh, delivered a uh, professional development session with us at the suny lit um, the learning innovation with technology conference so it's important to um, help your teachers to be enthusiastic about using technology that's incredibly important um, there was a lot of peer learning and training uh, that went into uh, getting those instructors ready to use this and other technologies. Um, you know, introduce this tool and these tools to students um, over time. You know, it's, it's ideal when students do have access to a learning lab and you can float around and help them to, you know, take the assessment, download the app, uh, but something uh, something that was important and built into their model was having those check-ins with students. You know, they not only have a teacher, but a case manager. Um, and one thing that they were able to achieve was integrating the app into class. So making it a core component of the program. Um, they also drove engagement with competitions. Um, and because they had full visibility in the command center, they could see who was, uh, you know, achieving those goals. You know, whether it was taking a live instruction class um, or simply completing a certain number of lessons and units. Some of the challenges. Well, um, digital literacy skills are, while the need is universal, um, you know, that having uh, digital fluency is not necessarily universal. Um, so one of their goals and something that they realized was that Part of their job is helping their students um, to break through that digital divide. You know, there is a, um, a component that's just related to having access to 
um, devices. You know, they've experimented with learner with loaner devices. Um, also, uh, just the fact that the platform is accessible on smartphones, that's something that virtually every student has access to. Um, Wi-Fi connectivity can make a difference. Not every student has an email address. Um, and the engine platform does support uh, mobile and text activation. Um, the digital literacy course, this was something that uh, informed our you know, content development plan. Um, and then just understanding that each student and each teacher has you know, different motivation and comfort level with technology. Um, so again, you know, keep track of your students, see who's you know, successfully up and running and provide support to those students who need a little bit uh, of extra help. Uh, there were a lot of teachable moments and um, a lot of peer learning. You know, some of these uh, instructors were able to, you know, effectively use the engine platform for homework and in, you know, as a substitute for, you know, textbook study. Um, so the more that you can help those early adopters and those, um, you know, those expert teachers, help them to, you know, share that information with other, you know, peers and other instructors. Uh, connect those lessons to everyday life, um, both during the uh, during their vacation, um, times off from study. Many of these students were continuing, you know, across semesters. Um, so having access to a digital platform allowed them for to continue their self study over van vacation. Um, as we mentioned, you know, digital resources. Um, including the app became incredibly important during the pandemic. Um, and they have, you know, formally included the building of digital literacy skills as a core component with their program. And I think every, every, you know, ABE and ESOL program needs to um, include that digital literacy um, foundation upfront. One of the interesting things, you know, Engine has a, a study that was done by the American Institutes for Research. Um, that was, you know, a, a third party evaluation trying to test out if access to Boxy Engine accelerated learning um, within, you know, a blended learning program. Um, AIR did find that. And also at Queens Public Library, they had a control group. Um, they were testing out, you know, which students, uh, which classes had access to Engine and others that didn't even though they were at the same level in their WIOA funded ESOL programs, um, they saw accelerated learning and accelerated NRS gains for the uh, Voxy Engine group. So those are two great examples of adult, pro adult education programs that have in integrated the platform and driven more efficiency with learning, expanded their reach to learners, helped learners make tr transitions to career training. One thing we wanted to talk about a little bit today is how the workplace itself is actually an ideal environment for English upskilling. Conversations that I'm having and hearing on a national level over the last three or four months keep pointing to the need for adult education programs to be more integrated into employer focused workforce training. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about why English makes sense as a workplace training program and how adult education providers can get involved. The first is that training is tied to real workplace needs. When you're working with a population that is all of the same employer, they have common goals and they're in an English rich environment where they can practice using English when they're not in class which means that the lessons that you build for them are really relevant to their needs, which goes a long way towards getting adult learners to pay attention. They can put what they're learning to use right away. Um, when they're doing this in a workplace and you track their activity and performance, it can be tied to workplace goals. And so their English skills rapidly develop because the, they're using what they're practicing. You can get feedback from how they're doing on the job and you can integrate feedback from supervisors into the English training that you're offering. So I wanted to go through, we have actually dozens of examples of adult education providers that we work with that help 
offer workplace training using our platform and instructors from a community college or adult education center or a community group. Um, here's one example. This is an employer-based English program that works with a local um, English program through a community refugee organization. And there is an internal champion. Employees are directly supported by the adult education partner. There are clear expectations set around engagement and goals. In this case, the employer pays the adult education provider for the comprehensive program. There are other models. Um, and Tad and I are happy to talk to anybody after the webinar or some other time about your own particular use case and what your funding looks like and how you could potentially work with employers. Employers and the employees in this case receive one-on-one -on -one guidance from the adult education provider and from the team at Voxy Engine. Outcomes are measured and reported and it connects to existing internal career pathway programs, including career exploration. We actually did a whole case study on this particular course, um, but here is some data that I thought was super interesting, which was that these employees are all part of a hospital system. And yes, they're all working on healthcare career related content, but in addition, they're seeking out English content on academic English, other professions, the hospitality industry. Uh, this is an, a quote from an, a news article that was written about this particular program. But the point here is that these learners, even though they're in a workplace-based program, have interests and goals that are independent of that workplace English program. And by leveraging a platform like ours that can really deliver personalized English instruction, an adult education provider can work with an employer to drive outcomes in an effective way using distance learning. So we wanted to talk a little bit about language-focused pre-apprenticeship programs. Um, we pulled from JFF's key characteristics for a quality apprenticeship program, which is where we would recommend anybody start with a language-focused apprenticeship program. Things like transparent entry and success requirements, um, culmination in one or more industry-recognized credentials, offering of academic career exploration and wraparound supports and transition into a registered apprenticeship. This is what a language focused pre-apprenticeship program needs to do. And we have a couple of examples of those. One was done um, in partnership between the state of Maryland and Baltimore Alliance for Careers in Healthcare. And this was an apprenticeship program inside of a hospital setting where they recruited both incumbent workers and also immigrants and refugees and they built in a whole special language component for the immigrant and refugee participants. Um, and they were very successful in helping learners get the language skills they needed specifically for this apprenticeship. Another example is one um, that we can, we, it's one of my favorites actually, because it's so specific and it's a language focused pre-apprenticeship for people who want to get credentialed as ski lift maintenance technicians. And you can imagine that this has a very specific language and we've taken that specific language and created a module of English language materials with an achievement test so that learners can get the language skills they need to then participate in that particular uh, apprenticeship program. And we can do something like that for any career that you can think of. So Tad was, was talking about what's in our current catalog and what's coming, but we also work on specific content for specific employers and specific jobs with partners all the time. So if you have a need or an interest in English for a specific employer, um, we're happy to talk to you about how to create something that's very customized to the language learning needs of those potential employees. We've said it over and over and over again, and I thought it would be nice to end with outcomes. Measuring performance is critical for funding. Um, and we, in our platform, have a research-backed assessment um, program that we've developed over a decade. And what we measure are time on task, which is the single biggest predictor of success, mastery of language and content. So I mentioned this earlier, but we look at achievement on every single module of instruction that learners complete. So we understand if they, if they understand the language and the structure and the concepts in the content that they're working through. We also look at um, proficiency improvement over time, stakeholder satisfaction. And my favorite metric for success is honestly real world success. 
people are learning English because they want to do something else. So we want to measure whether or not they can. And we have a 2021 Q1 impact report that looks at learners reporting of their ability to accomplish their real world goals, whether they are career goals, academic goals, personal goals. And we're happy to share that with anyone who's interested as well, because you can really see uh, the tie-in between improving English skills and success in accomplishing something real. And that fits with our theme of helping learners with the transition to college and career readiness. So to summarize, before we get to questions, because I'd like to save a few minutes for those, there's a massive disconnect between ESL programs, traditional ESL programs, and college and career readiness. Learning is completely moved online, and blended programs can increase equity and access at scale. Like thinking about the future, we should take the online learning that we've been doing and think about how to reach more people and reach them more effectively and efficiently. At the same time right now, employers are all facing a so-called talent crisis where they are unable to find workers. But speakers of other languages are often an overlooked worker population. They're overlooked because they don't have the English skills that people need for some of the jobs that are suffering from the so-called worker shortage or because they don't have the language skills for training programs. So if we can tailor career training programs to English learners needs and goals, we can increase the number of workers that we have ready to take these jobs. And this is a really clear place where adult education providers can work with employers to build these career focused ESL programs. Workplace language programs link learning to real world practice in a way that's almost impossible in a classroom. And technology can help you offer flexibility, um, efficacy and outcomes. So Tad and I wanted to take a few minutes to answer questions if there are any. And I think he's been monitoring the chat. So maybe he can tell me if we have any in there. I have been uh, checking the chat. There was some questions about pricing. I did put our um, nonprofit and educational back to school uh, special flyer in the chat. Um, our Typical pricing for nonprofit and education programs is $125 per annual seat. Those are transferable seats, so they can be used with different students across semesters. Um, or if someone drops out, someone else can be put in. But it is, uh, you know, that seat is tied to uh, one student at a time. Um, and the back to school promotion is at the 50 seat level. We do always have volume discounts. Um, if you want to learn more um, or see a demo of the platform, I put in a link in the chat that, um, oh, I didn't mean to, I didn't launch that poll, uh, <laughs> that did, um, you know, if you want to sign up for a demo on Wednesdays, please click on the link in the chat. Now, some of the questions were around different content areas advanced manufacturing. Yes, we do have some new content in that area. Early childhood um, education, that is on the horizon. Um, it's definitely a prioritized area for us. Um, let's see if there were other questions. Or if anyone has any questions now, feel free to chat them in. This is, so Katie, how do you manage your classroom when students are interested in different workforce pathways, but are in the same class? An excellent question. So learners should work on content relevant to their different workforce pathways and career exploration on their own. This is the perfect example of when you want to have a flipped classroom. Learners can then be in class together and work on common tasks, whether they are talking about different career exploration areas with their peers, giving presentations um, that are relevant to their own career pathways and goals, uh, we have a whole teacher playbook as well as personalized teacher professional development that we can offer to organizations to help you with this question because it's one we get all the time and it's one where using technology for personalized instruction can really help solve your problems. So some of the other questions that were um, answered uh, that were asked beforehand is uh, to do cost tracking and support. Uh, someone said they're very interested in participating, but they don't know if they're school. Uh, please, anyone, feel free to send an email. 
Um, do you have a presentation as, as a partner to employers? We have done a, a webinar that provides more in-depth advice about working with employers, you know, how to pitch, um, how to pitch potential programs to them. So I encourage you to visit our website. Um, uh, I will put it in the chat. I'll also put my email in the chat, um, but we do have that uh, webinar recorded. Sorry about the siren. Someone says they need more information and consider writing a grant. You know, please feel free to uh, reach out. Always happy to, um, you know, support that process of applying for funding, you know, understanding what the costs would be. Uh, do, there is one question. How do you tailor students' levels in the classroom to meet overall student needs? What was the first part before overall student needs? How do you tailor student levels in the classroom to meet overall student needs? Okay, so one of the things that happens with English as a second language classrooms is that learners will all be at different levels. This happens even when they are in a classroom that's all supposed to be the same level. Uh, so the good news is that you can have mixed level classrooms where learners are working on tasks to the extent that their proficiency level lets them and they can work on common tasks. So you can have a task like um, describe what you do at work or practice for a job interview or write a resume and learners will be able to do that at different proficiency levels and that's okay. So thinking about language level after you think about the common tasks makes a lot of sense. And then trying to group your learners so that they are practicing speaking English with different learners at different proficiency levels and moving them around from group to group is really useful when you have classrooms with mixed levels. You can also let learners um, in groups with mixed levels take turns talking to you and recording your conversation with the learners and giving other learners the chance to listen to it. There's a lot you can do to leverage technology to give learners real world practice. And again, we, we are able to do really tailored professional development programs for teachers and programs that are interested in trying to extend their reach by using technology like this. So I did put um, a link in the chat to our previous webinars and there are recordings and slides available. Um, I do understand that when you click on that, it, it gives you a warning, but I promise you that this that the website is safe. That's just a standard Zoom functionality. Uh, one question was, are the seats transferable? Yes. So if a student drops out, you can put someone else in the seat. Also, many of our partners will run different cohorts across semesters. Um, so those are the same seats and they can be used with different groups of students across semesters. And I mean, I think we, we both said this and we'll say it again. We work very closely with our partners, whether they are academic partners, employer partners, public library partners, to make sure that the platform is configured to your needs, that it meets your students' needs. As I said, I've spent 25 years working with adult English learners, both inside and outside the United States, um, but I started my career as an ESL teacher here and I built this platform to meet the needs of ESL teachers. It's designed to help you help your students get English more efficiently and more effectively. And so we are continuously working on the platform to make it more tailored to learners needs and more tailored to the needs of institutions. It's, a, it's an ongoing, um, it's, an, it's a, basically a living platform where we add new content to it all the time and new functionality. So we're in a continuous conversation with all of our partners about what they need and how to support them. Especially as they design the, you know, blended and virtual and hybrid models for the future. Um, because there are, you know, there have been, uh, you know, significant amounts of positive feedback about bringing more instruction online. It works for some students um, and those who don't have the digital literacy skills really need to build that foundation as quickly as possible. So they're not left out of learning opportunities, financial services, benefits, you know, and more and more of that is, um, you know, being required to, you know, interact with, you know, online resources. 
I think we're at time and we're probably gonna get kicked out. So thank you everyone very much for your active participation and please reach out to me or to Tad if you have questions. Absolutely, thanks so much. We really look forward to continuing this conversation. Um, head over to the Voxy Engine website. Um, you can register for a Wednesday demo. You can request a one-on-one -on -one demo. Um, and we would love to uh, talk about your needs and your learners' needs. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>